My son is five and goes to year one here in this wonderful institution. And at this age, he's fascinated with nature and animals. So we like to play at home this kind of a fun game by which there are questions and answers. And he tries to challenge my understanding of nature. And this is a fun game to me, actually. But if I have to be totally honest with you, it's a little bit um, disappointing because as it happens, I do not know most of the answers to his questions, actually. For example, I don't know which is the animal that is the smelliest, or I, things like that. And I should know, because I'm a professional biologist. But recently, my son did ask me a question which answer I knew. He asked me that, what is the deadliest animal in the world? And I knew the answer, but as usually I ask my son to lead the conversation. And he made some interesting proposals. Is it a shark? Is it the snake? It's a dinosaur? Uh, uh, well, I will start teaching evolution <laughs> to my son in a few years, but that's a nice proposal. And he also said my favorite neighbor's cat. You may be laughing, but you have not seen that cat. <laughs> So I think it came to a surprise to my son when I actually said, without blinking an eye, it's the mosquito. And of course, there is nothing about the size of the mosquito or his particular uh, aggressive behavior. What happens is that the mosquito carries different pathogens that affect uh, human uh, health. I've been uh, very proud during most of my career to work for malaria and dengue. So let me uh, give you some perspective in terms of numbers. In 2015 alone, malaria claimed the lives of over 400,000 people. The incidence of dengue has been rising at a very high rate of change during my lifetime. And this is caused to urbanization, of course, uh, international air travel, and climate change. An estimated 400 million infections occur every year, and from those, uh, around 20,000 end up in death. This is the geographical distribution of dengue. It's, in, it's present in 128 countries, in tropical and subtropical areas. This is a little bit over more than half of the world population. And around 3.5 billion of people are at risk. Of course, the boundaries of the, the geographical boundaries are expanding slowly but steadily due to climate change. So, what is happening here? So basically, uh, the dengue, uh, actually, uh, the dengue virus, which scientifically speaking is denoted by DNV, is transmitted when you are bitten by a, a female Aedes aegypti mosquito. And that happens typically in urban and suburban areas. So you need to actually uh, watch your home and take care of, uh, of that. Um, for most of us, dengue is just a very strong flu illness. It has high fever, it has a characteristic skin rash, and muscle and joint pain. And for some, this pain is very, uh, very, very strong. However, occasionally, in some people, dengue actually progresses into hemorrhagic fever, and this is really life-threatening. Uh, especially, it's the, one of the leading cause of death in children in this part of the world. There is no specific treatment for dengue fever, except one, Tra rush and go to the hospital and get proper, uh, proper hospital care. If you do that, the fatality rates can be as low as less than 1%. 
However, this is true for places like Singapore. As you can imagine, not everybody in the tropics has access to high quality uh, public health. So the World Health Organization recommends prevention of dengue through two uh, steps. One is, of course, uh, removal of the habitat of the mosquito and the use of insecticides. But also the World Health Organization thinks that to find a safe an effective vaccine for dengue is a high priority. And why they would say that? Let me remind you that from an economical perspective, a technological perspective, and a scientific perspective, vaccines are one of the most cost effective ways to save lives. Vaccines prevent approximately two to three million of deaths per year, and they have greatly reduced the burden of infectious diseases around the world. Some of them do not exist anymore, like smallpox. Now, we carry in our bodies a system that has a fantastic properties that make vaccines work, the immune system. The immune system is able to get information, process information, and memorizes it. Now, when I say information, in the case of the immune system, I mean molecular patterns of the pathogens. That could be a protein, a piece of a protein, a peptide, DNA, a piece of sugar, etc. Now, there is another system in the universe that has the same properties as the immune system. It's our central nervous system. And this is why education works, ladies and gentlemen. We may argue about the details, why education works or does not work, how education systems may be improved over time, what elements of education are old fashioned and they don't work anymore. But every, uh, overall education works because actually the properties of our brain uh, let me just say that how uh, brain memory works and uh, immunity memory works are completely different. They use different, uh, different cellular and molecular bases. So what are the tools that we immunologists have to educate our immune system? And that are vaccines. Now, there are lots of ways of doing vaccines. You can approach this in different ways. Um, the vaccine I'm working on, it's a life attenuated vaccine. That means that it actually, it's the whole vaccine, it's the whole thing, very similar to the dengue virus you would see in the wild. However, it has been modified genetically. And so by doing that, this, this, this virus is attenuated, is weakened is slower at replicating. So when you immunize a person, what will happen is that the dengue will just go to the target cell and hijack the biochemical machinery of the cell to replicate itself and make more, more copies of it. Now, this is, it does this at a very slow pace as the normal wild type dengue. So the immune system has time to mount a very effective immune response. It's able to see it, recognize it. It learns how to produce antibodies over time. And eventually, these antibodies will do two things. They will bind to the virus, or they will render the virus uh, neutralized. And also, these antibodies will help other parts of the immune system to actually clear up the virus from your body. This happens typically in around two to three weeks in humans. So next time you, you're, you get a bite, you, your body will not wait two weeks to mount an immune response. It will be there up and running in hours. So now I want to move to my involvement in all this, which is the actual development of a vaccine. And there are also different strategies to approach any problem, and this is a technical uh, problem like any other. You can approach it in different ways. Uh, 
I'm showing here one such possibility uh, by which a scientific idea could be translated directly on human beings. Does anybody of you see anything wrong here or questionable? Yeah, there are no safety checkpoints built in in this system. So we don't know if the vaccine works or the vaccine is toxic. Or there are some adverse uh, effects we were not aware of, simply because we still don't know 100% how the human body works. However, this is how vaccines were developed in the past. I'm talking about 200 years ago, and this is, the, for example, in England, uh, Dr. Jenner uh, produced a smallpox vaccine in this way. Now, he did not have a biotechnology, and, but this is something we have today. Biotechnology allow us to put between the scientific idea and the person, the patient, all these checkpoints by which we constantly test and evaluate for efficacy and safety. And what we want to do is make sure that the benefit always outweighs the harm. In reality, what we do is that we want to put the harm at that statistically as close as zero as possible. And I'm very glad to say that this is very often possible. However, I want to remind you that every single intervention, that be an aspirin, that be in a biological, that be the vaccines of the future, which probably will be made out of DNA alone, every intervention will have a risk. The only things that we have to manage are the risk. So, scientists and engineers, we team up together to manufacture all these large amounts of vaccine prototypes that are required in, in, in every single step of that process you see. And then, because there, there are liters and liters of vaccine needed to carry out all the experimental program and all the clinical essay program. And this is, for example, without going into details how we do it today. So basically, we have a specific cell type, and we just infect the cell, we assemble the cells on, together, we put the cells one on top of the other, and then we put them in a bioreactor. And we do that with the four serotypes of dengue. And this is how we harvest crude material after some days. And as an example, that is how a bioreactor looked back in the 50s, and that was used for the creation of penicillin. So things have evolved at a very short period of time. So we have this crude material we harvest, and what we do with it, we stabilize it, we eliminate impurities, and then we need to concentrate it to a usable volume and then we freeze it down. That is called the drug substance. And remember, we have four because the dengue is caused by four types of virus. When we are ready to formulate, we blend the four serotypes together. We stabilize again the clinical formulation. We freeze dry it, and then that's our final vaccine. It's the, it's the uh, vial you are with a cake inside that you are used to see and then that's ready for distribution to the field or to the scientists to carry on on experiments. Now, in every one of those steps, we take samples called intermediates, and those are continuously tested and evaluated to make sure that the vaccine is manufactured as intended. What that means? It means that the vaccine has the right specifications. Now, everything that is uh, manufactured has specifications. Planes, cars, iPhones. In the case of vaccines, the specifications mean that the vaccine has the desired physical, chemical, and biological properties and characteristics. Then when the specifications are okay, my team and I, we release the vaccine for clinical use, meaning that we give permission for the clinical trial to commence. 
So far, the vaccine has uh, played out very well. It has passed all the tests with flying colors. It's very effective. It's not toxic. And now it's entering phase three, which actually is the last stage and it's ongoing. So looking ahead, I feel very optimistic about this program. And I want to uh, finalize by showing that actually uh, transforming scientific ideas into life-saving medicines is actually a collaborat collaborative and multidisciplinary effort of many types of scientists, engineers, mathematicians, and medical doctors. And this is a truly powerful uh, domino effect. So thank you for listening.